song service this morning and the prayer and the acknowledgement of God's sovereignty. Also thankful that Brother Allen mentioned in his prayer the fruit of the Spirit. And this morning, if the Lord will help us, we'll think about the fruit of the Spirit. But I wanted to just start with a story that I told before, I think, popped into my mind as the prayer requests were being made. And the story that popped into my mind was a time when there were a couple of uh, preachers and they had uh, received a visit from one of the deacons in the church. And this is a true story from what I've heard this man tell it. And he, it was an older preacher and a younger preacher, and not a young man, but a younger than the older guy. And the deacon had come over to tell them that he had gotten a bad report from the doctor. And he said, I, I've got cancer and I have six months to live. And they just sat there quietly for a while. And finally, the younger preacher spoke up and he said, you know, brother, we all have a cancer. We all have a cancer. You know, you might think about that and think, well, that's kind of an insensitive thing to say. But as I thought about that story more and more, it's really a compassionate thing to say because we all have something in us that's working death. And some of us, that, that which was within us that's working death has caused a disease or a malfunction of a gene that's then turned into a cancer but even if we don't physically have something that the doctors might name as cancer, we do have death working in every single one of us. You may have a cancer that may be a prognosis of death within six months or 12 months or a couple years. Sometimes they'll say you've got a few years. But I may have a cancer standing right here that I don't know about just yet, some other kind of a cancer that's going to take me out in a week. And that's not a pleasant, perhaps, what think, way to think about life, but it, it's, it's factual and it's true. Of course, we all recognize that. But it's also helpful for me to understand and try to think about death when it is viewed from the perspective of God. God does not view the death of his saints is something that is, is nearly quite so tragic as we view it. We go home to him. And that is one of the blessings of living in a time after Jesus Christ has revealed all that he has revealed. He has shown us when he died upon that cross, the things that he said there where he confessed he was going to be that day in paradise. We know where we go on the day that we die, whether it's six months from now or 12 months or years, maybe decades. We know on that day where we go. And thanks be to God and Jesus Christ that we live in a time when we have that understanding because of what he did for us. Last week I preached on the natures, the two natures of the regenerate child of God. Those terms are somewhat re redundant. If you are a child of God, you are regenerate. And if you are regenerate, you are a child of God. I take that back. You, if you are a child of God, you will be. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, it's difficult to hear me. If you are a child of God, you will be a regenerate, but you might not be currently. But every regenerate person is a child of God. And I try to talk about how to recognize and think about that struggle that goes on with every, within every one of us who are born of the Spirit, and how it's helpful to, to know what's happening inside of you when you have these different motivations, these different feelings, these different, these, these different uh, 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 being moved in different ways. It, it's helpful to know what's going on. To me, just like it's helpful to know what's going on in your car 
if you know a little bit about your engine, you're a lot more prepared to kind of diagnose what's happening on any particular day, especially when you run into some trouble. And if you were here last week, you remember that I tried to relate being moved by the flesh or your carnal nature versus moved by the spirit as uh, try to relate that as, as to being in different gears in a car, forward or reverse. And so this morning, I wanted to maybe extend that idea and to, to think about what the Bible says are the fruit of the Spirit. It's an interesting way that the book of Galatians says that uh, frames that. It doesn't say the fruits of the Spirit. It says the fruit of the Spirit, singular, but then it lists nine things. But these are the fruit of the Spirit, and it lists nine things. It's also interesting that when the Spirit moved Paul to talk about these nine things, that he uses the phrase or the word fruit, because fruit is something we can understand. We recognize that trees plants give off fruit. And so the Lord is doing what he often does, which is taking an example that his readers or hearers would understand and in drawing a spiritual lesson from a natural illustration. And I say the Lord does that because this is the Spirit moving the Apostle Paul to write these things. One trick, one trick that the world tries to use against people who believe the Bible, is to try to trip us up by uh, putting one, got one writer of the Bible against another writer of the Bible. You will hear this a lot in the world's definition of love. They'll try to say that Jesus talked about loving people in one way, and the Apostle Paul did not completely agree with the way that Jesus talked about loving people. And then they'll also try to pit uh, New Testament against Old Testament. And I'm here to say to you that all of those things harmonize, and there is one author of the Bible. There is one, one author, even though there were many writers. So all of these things go together, and we should not allow ourselves to think about what the Bible has to say uh, with one writer compared to another writer. Maybe we'll talk a little bit more about that as we proceed. But let's turn to the book of Galatians, and we'll be in chapter 5, and we'll read here a few verses that are about uh, the subject that I just opened. As we're doing that, let us remember that the Lord uh, tells us to bear fruit. He expects us to bear fruit, to to, to do things, to, to accomplish things, to do things. And he tells us this in a number of different ways. I'm talking about fruit, and that's going to be the illustration we're going to grab this morning. That's one of the ways that he uh, uses to talk about bearing fruit or, or to, to, to do things. Another way is he talks about talents. You remember, may remember he told a parable about talents and how he gives talents and then he expects a return on these talents. And so the idea of, of progressing or growing or, uh, or moving forward or doing things, that is, that is part of, uh, of the Lord's instruction to all of his children to grow, to, to do things, to, to return on his investment. And so you think about that, you think, okay, so the Lord expects me, wants me, it is his will for me, to, to, to try to, to do something in this world, to try to bear fruit. He, he, that's what he wants, us to bear fruit. So, okay, so the Lord expects me to do that. And I, I would submit to you that there are obviously different seasons of life, but sometimes I I've, I've, have found that we can become, we can feel like we're in a rut with church. We can feel even bored sometimes with church because we do, in fact, every Sunday come to the same place. Uh, we do, in fact, sort of go through the same general things, what we understand the New Testament to prescribe as worship. We do these things. And it's, it's, 
easy to see how a person could at various seasons of their life become a little bored with it all. And I would submit to you that as you naturally start to feel that way, that the question that that should prompt in your mind is the idea of, well, maybe, maybe the problem is I'm not attempting to bring forth fruit. I'm not actually uh, trying to, to, to bear fruit like the Lord uh, instructs me to do. In fact, uh, I think about this often. One time, in one place, the Apostle Paul, I think it's about 1 Timothy chapter 1, I think it is, where the Apostle Paul tells Timothy to stir up his gift, the gift that is within you. It's interesting that Timothy, who seemed to be somewhat of a timid person, the Apostle Paul had to tell him, you need to stir up. That's, that's the Apostle Paul's word, stir. To actively move around in the glass, what's in the glass, to, to make it do stuff. And he was encouraging Timothy to sort of step out of his comfort zone. And the idea of bearing fruit is, in fact, just that. And so if you feel this morning a little, maybe a little bored or in a rut or I, I would uh, suggest to you to examine the idea of, of your bearing fruit. Now, as the, the writer, as the Apostle Paul writes here in Galatians 5, we're going to see, okay, if we're going to bear fruit, what, what is it that I might think about to, to try to, to, to understand how to bear fruit or what kind of fruit should I bear? That's a legitimate question. As you think about, well, if I'm going to, if I'm going to bear fruit, the, you know, a lot of people would think about well, what that means is, is you, you get conversions. You get people to come to church and they, they are converted by the gospel message. Obviously, if you were involved in that situation, many of you have been and still are, that is, that is of course, an idea of bearing fruit. But I would submit to you that bearing fruit in the, in the life, in the, in the overall life of the child of God, of the Christian, is, it's, it's much more than that. There are, there are all sorts of fruits. There are small fruits and large fruits, right? There, we would think some, someone who comes to church at our exhortation is converted by the gospel, becomes a Christian, like that would be a large fruit. That would be a, a very glorious thing, and certainly it is. That's God's work, but you were involved in it, you see. But the idea of, of other kinds of fruits that we might bear every single day, that is, that is something that we can think about. I can think about every, today, on this day, what fruit might I try to bear? And if you're thinking about that on a regular basis, then it's very, it's difficult for church to be boring because you're always trying to grow. You're, you're always trying to move forward into into other areas. Now, I always get a little nervous, be, and you know, this is just this is just fear is all it is, quite frankly. Is that when when you when I, when you get up and I preach a sermon like this, it's like somebody's going to come ask me to do something that that really they have no gift to do. But that's just part of it. That's just part of of us being together and trying to to progress the kingdom of God and bear fruit in it. Sometimes that happens. I've done that myself. I've taken on things that I thought, this is, going to be, this is going to be so much fun. I'm going to enjoy this so much. And I hated it. I was terrible at it. And so, okay, stop, turn around, and go back. Not that big a deal. But the idea of, of trying to bear fruit is one that is, is, is in our, it should be in our minds because the, 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 the Spirit has fruit. The fruit of the Spirit. And there are nine things here that I have mentioned. But before I read these nine things, I would also submit to your reading that the uh, chapter 5 of the book of Galatians talks about the manifestation of the other nature that we have that I talked about last Sunday. And I talked about it in sort of general terms. This morning, we're going to put some, some names to them because here in Galatians 5, the Apostle Paul will talk about the works of the flesh, which is another way of saying when you're in your carnal nature, when you're moved by your carnal nature, 
These are some of the things that you can expect to come from that. And last week was a lot about just trying to recognize, am I in this moment in time being moved by my carnal nature or the Spirit of God? And so here we see the Apostle Paul says, well, here's some works of the flesh, which tells us if someone is doing these things, you know what they're being motivated by. You can logically work backwards. If I see the manifestation of a thing, then I know that the origin of that thing is not in the Spirit of God. It is in the works of the flesh. And so he gives us a list here of, by my count, 17 things. This is Galatians chapter, let's start chapter 5, let's start verse 18 because this helps frame what we're talking about. But if ye be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh, I'll stop here and just remind you that last Sunday we thought about Romans chapter 7 where the Apostle Paul talks about the works of the flesh and the flesh is not the, he's not talking about the the meaty part of his body. He's talking about his carnal nature. We went through Romans 7 to prove that unequivocally because the flesh that he's talking about in Romans 7 has a will and it moves him to do things. He's not talking about what he does. He's talking about that which is within him that moves him to do things. This is carnal nature. And so now, same thing. We're not talking about your physical body necessarily. We're talking about that which is within you that moves you to do sin or as I gave the example, eating a whole half gallon of bluebell, and that was that that I can readily confess that is that is a, a movement that that is that is my carnal nature that moves me to do that. And I have to admit, last night I ate many many candy bars, and so that still exists within me to my shame. The works of the flesh or our carnal nature. Here they are, they're manifest, which are these. And I would submit to you, he's not saying this is an exhaustive list because he doesn't say this is the work of the flesh like he does the work of the spirit, the fruit of the spirit. These are plural, and he's, he's uh, thereby saying this is not an exhaustive list, but these are certainly some of the things that come from the flesh. Adultery and fornication. You know, these days, fornication is just commonplace. And... Often it's presented as like the wiser path to choose in progressing with a relationship. False. Here the Bible says fornication is a work of the flesh. So engagement in fornication, you know its origin. You don't have to be confused in your mind. Is God moving this person to commit fornication? No, He's not. He's not. So all of the watered down sort of flowery terms that that we give in our day and age for fornication they're just they're just that they're just a way to try to change the name of a thing so it doesn't sound quite so harsh if you call it something else then it's a little less easily recognizable as a work of the flesh but it is it's a work of the flesh adultery fornication and uncleanness, and generally these things don't necessarily don't mean physical, they mean spiritual types of things, but uncleanness and lasciviousness or unbridled lust, idolatry is, you know, some of these things, the first several things are about, about lust and unbridled lust, and they are things that we might recognize as very, as very serious sins. But who among us can say we don't, on a regular basis, we're not... Who among us can say that on a regular basis we're not confronted with some type of idolatry? I would think every single person in this room can confess that idolatry is something that is a constant uh, temptation to worship. And even though we think, well, you know, idolatry, that's bowing down and worshiping something. I'm I'm not idolatry, I'm not I'm not committing idolatry if I'm not like physically bowing down and worshiping. No, you can commit idolatry just sitting in front of the TV, worshiping some show or some person or something like that. It's a work of the flesh. And so we find witchcraft or sorcery, which is in many places in the Bible tied to drug abuse, the use of drugs to perform certain things or to feel certain ways. Hatred. Hatred is a work of the flesh. 
And so, you know, the idea of, of hating things uh, is, is sometimes a work of the flesh. However, the world would, would take this so far as to try to say, if you, if you hate anything, then you are sinning against your God and the Bible because the Bible says to love your neighbor. And to, you know, it doesn't say to hate your neighbor. But you also have to understand that God uh, has a great and perfect hatred for, for, this, for the, the wicked. Uh, he hates things. And so it's a trick of the world to try to turn the words of the Bible around and say that you're not being Christian if you don't love everybody and everything everybody does. So be very careful that you do not swallow that worldly philosophy. However, we do find here that hatred is one of the works of the flesh. I've already said, if, if when God says he loves Jacob and he hates Esau, are you going to try to say God is sinning because he has hate in him? No, of course not. That's ridiculous. And David, in one place, in one of the Psalms, says, I do not I hate them that hate thee. That there is, in fact, righteous indignation and hatred for sin, and God has that. But that's not what this is talking about. But I don't think we have to try to be that theologically technical. I think 95% of the Bible is very easy to understand on its surface. And so when we read that a work of the flesh is hatred, I think we pretty much know what that means. Pretty much 95% of all circumstances, when I am engaging in hatred, that I can recognize, you know, I'm not really involved in righteous indignation at sin here, I'm just hating somebody because that's what I feel like doing. And that's a work of the flesh. Not righteous indignation at sin. You can hate sin. You can hate wicked philosophy. You can hate things in this world that are against God, that oppose God, that are at complete variance with God. Those are not what's being discussed here. What's being discussed here is I, I don't like you, and therefore I have decided to hate you. That's a work of the flesh. Variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, those are all in a very those are all in a very general category in and of themselves. So we're talking about sort of an extension of hatred where we have wrath or strife. And we find that I think to me what what encaptures most of these things is the word emulation. And sometimes you hear the word emulation used as a synonym for imitation. Imitation. And that is one of my little pet peeves of using that word, those two words, to mean the exact same thing. And I have heard some, some people say, you know, I want to imitate Christ, and that certainly, that's what we want to do. But then I have heard some people say, I want to emulate Christ. Well, that's not correct. You don't you don't want to, nor can you, emulate Christ because to imitate means to, to copy, to do, to do what he does. To emulate means to, to dominate over, to, 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 uh, to exceed and overpower, to emulate. And that's just, you know, I don't get all bent out of shape if somebody says emulate. I just, I know what they mean. But emulation, the idea of, of like a competition but in this competition, I'm not trying to do my best. And while you know, I respect you for trying to do your best, in this competition, I'm trying to dominate and subjugate and humiliate you. And this is, I watch sports. One of the things you see most common in every, almost every sporting event is one person who has a good, better play than the other person, and they will try to emulate or dominate over the other person. That's a sin. That's a work of the flesh. That is not glorify God. You can engage in competition and not emulate, not do this work of the flesh, but often that's not the case. So we find emulations. To me, in my mind, I just think about that sort of, uh, that picture in my mind to understand, okay, if I am, if I am trying to, to, to dominate and subjugate another person at work or in a sporting event, or in, in any case, that I'm not really concerned about their well-being and I'm not trying to help them. I'm trying to show them how right I am and how dumb they are. 
then I am engaged in emulating, and that's a work of the flesh. That's not moved by the Spirit of God. Envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Again, he's saying there's more to this than what he has just said, but enough of, enough of that. We've spent enough time on that. Let's look at something that's more beautiful to look at. He says in verse 22 as a contrast, but the fruit, the fruit of the Spirit. This is what we're after. This is what I'm to be constantly engaged in, to try to bring forth some of these things. If you bring forth some of these things, one or more of these things, you, you have shown forth the fruit of the Spirit. It's, of course, part of our important part of our doctrine to recognize that when somebody does one of these things genuinely, when they genuinely manifest love, for instance, not fake love like the Bible says, like love everything and everybody, no matter what anybody does, no matter how contrary it is to the Word of God, you know, not that. When they genuinely manifest the love of God in their lives, just like a work of the flesh, you can work backwards to understand that person's, when they commit a work of the flesh, they're motivated, motivated by the flesh. You can work backwards by the fruit of the Spirit. When they manifest the fruit of the Spirit, you know that person has to be born of the Spirit. Otherwise, they could not manifest the fruit of the Spirit. You say, why is that? It's because of what I said last week. If you have a carnal nature, you're born with a carnal nature. That is part of you coming into this world or you being conceived after conception. At conception, you have this carnal nature at conception. There's no other logical reason, there's no other logical place to draw the line between life and, and not life. There's no, it's not three months, it's not six weeks, it's not six months, it's at conception. At conception, you have a soul. I don't care what your physical appearance looks like. I recognize it's just a matter of a handful of cells, if that much. But at conception, you have a soul. And at conception, when you have a soul, that soul, outside the grace of God, is completely natural man. And you do only the works of natural man. And so that, that is, if you are not in a, of a, the elect of God and God has not seen fit in His mercy and grace, which He is not to everybody, has not seen fit. It was according to His will, that He did not redeem everybody. That is undeniable and easily proven in the Scriptures. John chapter 10, the Lord Jesus Christ will say, He died for His sheep. Then He'll turn around like five verses later and say, You're not of my sheep. Undeniable. Airtight cannot be argued, even though it constantly is. But among the sheep of God, at some point in their life, after conception... Maybe it's three weeks, maybe it's six months. We, again, John the Baptist leaped for joy. He jumped for joy in his mother's womb. If you haven't gotten there yet, but if you read the work, the, the work of the fruit of the Spirit, you'll find joy is there. And that is how you know the Bible here is here saying to you, here is John's reaction to the proclamation from Mary that she, that, that, that she is with child, or her voice, he heard her voice, but he... He knew what was going on. That here is, is the Bible telling you that at John the Baptist, six months post-conception, still in his mother's womb, has, has borne a fruit, the fruit of the Spirit. It's telling you he has a reaction. It's a spiritual reaction, and he's born of he's obviously born of the Spirit because he could not manifest joy. He could not bear the fruit of joy if he were not born of the Spirit. So here we find the Bible telling you, even at six months post-conception, a person can be born of the Spirit. But at conception, that is not the case. Not for you, not for anybody. You're born a natural man, which is true for men and women. We're talking about your carnal nature. But after that, after that, we're born of the Spirit. By God's grace, his elect child is born of the Spirit at the time that he sees fit. And then you have the capability to bring forth the fruit of the Spirit. And if you manifest the fruit of the Spirit, it's easy to see the logic, to work backwards. 
this person's manifesting the fruit of the Spirit. They are born of the Spirit. <clears throat> One of the glorious things, and I guess I'll hit this point again, I'm sort of off track here, but last I talked about John 3, and it talks about, talks about the Spirit, and there's no recipe that you can perform to bring the Spirit to you to regenerate your soul, to be born of the Spirit. There's, no, there's nothing you can do. There's no steps you can take. And John chapter 3 talks about that explicitly, that the Spirit goes where it, where it listeth, like the wind. It goes where it wants. So it, it, there's nothing you can do, steps you can take, to, to force the Spirit to come where you are. This is the sovereign grace of God. And so the Spirit, when it, when it, when it bears, when it comes and it, it regenerates a, a a, child, a soul of a child of God, when that happens, one of the glorious things about what we believe the Bible to teach and proclaim it teaches is that is, that is independent of, of a recipe, of ingredients, of means. And so the Spirit can regenerate the soul of, 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 a, of a Navy officer as they're sinking in their damaged sub going to the bottom of the ocean to a certain death. You don't need someone to come in there and in that, in that sinking sub, when it's got minutes, that guy's got minutes left to live, that you don't need someone to pipe in the gospel to, to, to save that person eternally, that the Spirit can go to the very depths of the ocean and regenerate a person's soul if it so chooses. At anywhere, anytime, outside the means of man, outside ingredients or a recipe, that the Spirit of God, every single child of God, will be regenerated. The Spirit of God does it whenever... It is His will, according to the will of God, to do so. And a person outside these means can manifest the fruit of the Spirit. So there can be people who lived long ago who manifest the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, people now who live in parts of the world that don't have the gospel preached regularly and readily the Spirit of God is not limited by anything. And it is comforting to me to know that every child of God, their eternal salvation, every, every single one of them, <laughs> that their eternal salvation, because of what I just said, what the Bible teaches about that, that their eternal salvation is not dependent on something I do or don't do. Something I should do and I'm negligent to do. Or... Uh, something I'm trying to do and really just is making a mess of things. But the Spirit of God in His sovereignty according to the will of God through Jesus Christ, every single person that Christ died for will be redeemed. And so you have these people outside the gospel of God, God manifesting the fruit of the Spirit because of a number of reasons, but let's just give the obvious reason. There's people who lived before Jesus Christ came. They had no access to the gospel of God in the sense that we have it, and yet those people were regenerated just as we are, and they, those people who lived, who lived before the, the gospel of Jesus Christ was, was as clear as it is now, because I think the gospel has always been here, but it's never been so clear as it is now. The story of Christ being prophesied even from the Garden of Eden after the fall in Genesis 3.15 was where God made a promise to Eve, the seed of the woman, uh, shall bruise the head of the seed of the serpent. And it started then. But nonetheless, we recognize that there are people who live in times and places who are outside the name of Jesus Christ, explicitly knowing that name to refer to the Son of God. They're outside that. And those people can be people who have love, who, who manifest the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit. They manifest love, and they manifest joy and peace and long-suffering. We'll go down this list in, in just a moment. But here we find, I guess we'll just talk about it. We have love, and joy, and peace, and long-suffering, and gentleness, and goodness, and faith, and temperance, or meekness, and temperance. Ninefold fruit of the Spirit. And we grab faith a lot. That word faith, we grab that a lot. But that's, and it's a, it's a, there's a reason for it. There's a reason that you hear on a regular basis. Faith is a fruit of the Spirit. Faith is a fruit of the Spirit. Faith is a fruit of the Spirit. That, that's important. 
You hear that a lot from our pulpits and, 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 and in our writings. You hear that a lot because what we're, what we're trying to point out there is that here is a difference, a distinction between what we understand the Bible to teach and what others may teach, which is you have faith before you have the Spirit. That, that, is, a, that is a teaching. But we disagree with that. Because right here, the Bible says if you have faith, you only have faith because it is a fruit, it is downstream of the tree. And so you only have faith if you have already have the Spirit. Now, we, we, we grab onto that, and that's the, there's a reason for it, and it's important. However, let's not overlook the other eight fruit of the Spirit, because those are equally as important. It's, it's just we grab faith a lot because a whole system of, 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 of philosophy has been built on the idea of faith preceding the Spirit. So that's why we often just refer to faith. Hey, faith is a fruit of the Spirit. But there's joy. that The fruit of the Spirit includes joy. In fact, I've thought this many times, and I, I, don't, I don't know, I'm not quite yet ready to say this is an absolute. Uh, but to me, it makes sense. If, if these are ninefold fruit of the Spirit, these are the fruit of the Spirit, then it seems to me that where the Spirit is, all of these must be there. You, you can't have one of them missing if these are the fruit of the Spirit. Now, to varying degrees, perhaps, but they must all exist. If the fruit is there, the, 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 the Spirit, if the, the Spirit is there and these are a manifestation of the Spirit or a fruit of the Spirit, then they would all need to be there to, in, in varying degrees, for sure. So we find here, if okay, if the Spirit is within my soul, then whether I recognize it or not, whether I'm being moved by it or not, if the Spirit is in my soul, then love is also in my soul. That love must be there. If I, if I have a measure of faith simply by the, the Spirit being there, and that's... What, what we say is that if the Spirit is, if the Spirit is there, then you have faith because the faith goes along with the Spirit. Whether you're using that faith or not, that's another question. But if the Spirit is there, then you have the ability to manifest that fruit of the Spirit. Well, the same ought to be for, for joy or for love. Let's go back to the first one, for love. So here I'm thinking, okay, back to kind of where I started. Here I'm, I'm a child of God and I'm, I want to bear fruit for God. I want to bear fruit for Jesus Christ. So what do I do? What do I do? Well, the first thing to start looking at is if, if I were to accomplish my desire of bearing fruit, what would it look like? Well, it would have to look like love, and it would have to look like joy, and it would have to look like peace. So whatever I do... It would, it would look like these things because these are the fruit of the Spirit. I'm making myself halfway clear. It would look like love and joy and peace. And so often I think about, okay, well, <clears throat> you know, that's, that's easy to say, but I like things to be, as I've said, like an instruction manual for my lawnmower. I would, if I were writing the Bible, it would be terrible. But if I were writing it, I would write it like the instruction manual for my lawnmower. Step one, do this. Step two, do this. Step three, do this. It would be very boring to read, but it would be, be functional. It's, it's, I'm not saying it's not functional. I'm just saying that's how I think. And so I try to think, okay, love and joy and peace, the first three of the fruit of the Spirit, what, what would that look like in the world, be, being manifest, being somebody doing it? And the easiest answer to that question always is, is, like, is like when one of the disciples, I think it's John chapter 14, one of the disciples, the Lord's talking about the Father, and, and, the, and the disciple says, well, show us the Father. Show us the Father and we'll believe. And the Lord says, knucklehead, you've seen the Father. That's not what he says, but that's in essence what he says. He says, you, you have seen the Father. And what he's, what he's talking about is you've seen me, him. Christ. You've seen Jesus Christ. And when you see Jesus Christ, you're looking at everything the Father is. Their, their nature is the same. The Lord does exactly the will of the Father all the time. And so whatever you 
try to imagine the Father is, if you just look at Jesus Christ, you're going to see who the Father is, what He values, how the Father would act and react to things to speak as a man. That you, In Jesus Christ, you're seeing the fruit of the Spirit being born all of the time. And so the Lord, He talks about, even in John, in John chapter, well, John like 14, 15, 16, and 17, which is a, a sort of a monologue that the Lord gives the night before He was crucified. And part of that is a prayer, 17 is a prayer that He prayed. But if you just read these chapters, you find that some of the interesting words that he uses are uh, the fruit of the Spirit. So again, the fruit of the Spirit, love and joy, and peace and long-suffering. Number four, interesting, number four, long-suffering is the first indication of pain. To long-suffer, God long-suffers. The Bible says in a number of places, numerous places, he long-suffers. Uh, which in, in, my, in my words, my paraphrase, he puts up with things for a time because he has a grander purpose. He puts up with, up with things for a time. So the, he long suffers the wicked. He long suffers the wicked for a time. But there will be a time when all of that will end. And, you know, sometimes I think, good grief, Lord, it's like, like the saints, I think it's Revelation 5, they're, they're, they're praying and they're like, how long? How long, Lord? No, that's not Revelation 5. It might be like Revelation 6 or 7. But anyway, in the book of Revelation, it's a picture of these saints in heaven and they're praying, how long until you, until you avenge us? How long? And sometimes I, I think that, Lord, enough with the long suffering. Let's short suffer this and be done. But you know, the Bible says, when it talks about the long suffering of God towards the wicked, the vessels of wrath, that's how the Bible puts it, that's Romans chapter 9, where it talks about the long, long suffers the vessels of wrath. That God's long suffering, that part of his nature, extends to the wicked and he uses it towards the wicked for the purposes that I just described. But that long suffering of God, which is the, the fruit of the Spirit, also extends to you, does it not, and to me? <laughs> I mean, I'm standing right here before you because God has long suffered me for almost 53 years. He has just, he, and, and the, so the grace of his long suffering that I sometimes pray to be done, I have to admit, if I'm really honest, I want it to be done for some people and not for others. I want his long suffering to just continue on ad infinitum for me and to end for other people. Well, I don't get to decide that. But number four, long suffering, is, it's an interesting that in the list of the fruit of the Spirit, that's the first one that's an indication of, I, I pain is my word, but discomfort. And I think we all recognize when we're long-suffering something, we're suffering. We are being patient with something that we are not crazy about. But again, back to John 14, 15, 14 through 17, you find that here in these chapters, the night before the Lord is to be crucified and to go away from His disciples, from His apostles, He's been with them personally, right up close for years, and now he is preparing them for his departure when they will be alone, as far as he's concerned. Things are about to change. And he's talking to them about the spirit that's going to come to them in a, in a special way and help them because he's now going to be gone. They won't be able to just walk up to him and ask him a direct question face to face like they have been able to for years. And so he's telling them, when I leave, the Spirit is going to come. And in, and in these chapters, he talks about, he uses the fruit of the Spirit to describe their state after he departs and the Spirit comes. He doesn't use all of those words, but he uses enough of them to allow me to understand he, he, all of them are implied. For instance, John chapter 14, verse 27, he says, let me get read 26, but the Comforter which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. And then he says this, he says, Peace, peace I leave with you. Love, 
joy, peace, the fruit of the Spirit. Peace I leave with you. If you have the Spirit in your heart this morning, no matter how tumultuous you, your mind may be, no matter how troubled your heart may be, the Spirit of God within us, the fruit of the Spirit of God includes peace. You can be at peace. In fact, I look at people who are more sanctified than I am, who seem to be, who seem to understand the state of the world. They're not oblivious and they're not naive. They understand the state of the world, and yet they don't seem to be quite so troubled by it as I am. They seem to be at peace. They are as, as much opposed, as much opposed to the wicked doctrine that seems to be going around the globe, all of these manifestations of the, of the wicked doctrines of, which has their origin in one place, which is the devil, that, that they, are, they recognize that, they oppose it as much as I do, but yet they seem to be a person of peace. And you think that's contradictory. You can't be disturbed by the way the world acts and just openly flaunts ungodliness and at the same time be at peace. But I think that can't possibly be true. There must, in fact, be a way to love God and live in a wicked world and to be at peace. Because the Lord says, I'm going away. I'm sending the Comforter. And what you're going to have when the Comforter is there is peace. Now, he didn't mince words. He told them later in these same passage, 16, you're going you're gonna to have strong opposition. There are going to be people that when they kill you, they think they're doing God's service. One undeniable conclusion of that statement, that's John chapter 16, verse 2, is that some of these guys are going to be killed. That's how strong the opposition was going to be to what they were going to have to go forward and do. But the Lord says, but I'm leaving you peace. I'm leaving you peace. 15 verse 11, these things have I spoken to you, unto you, that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. The Lord Jesus Christ, here on the night before he was crucified, openly confessed he had joy. He openly confessed the night before he was crucified. The night before he faced a bigger obstacle, if I can use a phrase of a man, a, a bigger challenge than any challenge we face this morning. We face a challenge of seemingly in, in every quarter, in the schools, in the government, in our own churches, and our families, just all around us are challenges, are just ungodly philosophies promoted and encouraged and well-funded. And I sometimes lose my peace when I recognize how many battles seemingly have to be fought. But I now sort of am saying to myself and reminding myself that all of those challenges pale in comparison to having to go to the cross and bear the sins of countless millions of people before a just and holy and righteous God, to whom up until that point you had had perfect harmony with. And now you, Jesus, now Jesus will have to look in the face of His Father, and instead of seeing a loving, harmonious relationship with a triune, with a, with a, with a member of the Trinity, what He's going to see is a wrathful, angry judge of a Father that pours out the, the, the wickedness, the, to, to bear the wickedness, that, to bear the sins, to bear the punishment of the wickedness, I'm trying to say, that we all should have borne, that that's what he's going to have to see. And you know, I can say that, and it's easy to say, but I'm telling you here, there in no way in those words do I capture the gravity of what that was. And in less than, 20, in less than like 12 hours, that's where he's going to be. But in this moment, in this time, in the darkness of the Garden of Gethsemane, Gethsemane, minutes, 
before he's to be arrested and to suffer himself to be arrested, he says, I have joy and I have peace. Because that's the fruit of the Spirit. And he had the, he had the Spirit without measure. If Jesus Christ can look, can, can see that he will be hanging from a cross in less than 12 hours and be at peace and have joy in his heart, I don't know why in the world I can't. I don't know why in the world. And the only reason I can conclude is because I just decide not to. I just decide to, to be moved by my carnal nature and not seek to bear, to bear the fruit of the Spirit of God. So I don't think I, I'll close right there. I don't need to, think I need to go through the list extensively, but I would just say love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, gentleness, faith, meekness, temperance. You want to know what those mean? Look at the life of Jesus Christ. He manifests all those things, quite frankly, all the time. And so when I am trying to bear the fruit of the Spirit, I'm trying to grow in my personal life, and my personal devotion to Jesus Christ, and I want to bear fruit, then probably the first thing I can do is I can just start looking at my own heart. And in my own heart, am I manifesting the fruit of the Spirit? Am I, am I, I can oppose stuff. Don't, don't get me wrong. But in my heart, am I afraid of what man's going to do to me? In my heart, am I afraid of where all this is going? In my, in my heart, am I intimidated or scared or Am I feeling all of those feelings? Am I hating people unrighteously? Am I emulate or call, trying to cause strife or, or wrath? Or Am I doing all those? Okay, in my own heart. If you want to bear fruit, then just look at your own heart. Do you see the fruit of the Spirit there? And you know, frankly, I could say a lot of times, no. Okay, that's where you start. You want to bear fruit today, right now? Then just start manifesting Love and joy and peace, long suffering, gentleness and goodness, and faith and meekness and temperance. Just start manifesting that. Just start doing that in your life. If you need an example, Jesus Christ will show you the perfect example. And then if you do that, I think you'll see church is not a bore, it's a joy. The Christian life is not a bore, it's a joy. You're constantly engaged, engaged with the Son of God who is blessing you in what ways you might seem very seem to you very simple. That's okay. You, don't, you can't always every single day do something great and grand. But it's not boring because you're, you're involved with the Son of God who manifests Himself every single day in your life when you're walking by the Spirit. There'll be no condemnation in your hearts. That's Romans 8, 1. You walk, you walk according to the Spirit, there's not any condemnation. Like, okay. I can live in a world that seems just off the rails, but I can be at peace and experience joy because Jesus Christ showed me the way. Let's sing a hymn as we...